All right, so we have another speaker coming up to talk to us about neuropsychology of ataxia. We have Aaron, Dr. Aaron Ritter with us, and he directs the Memory and Cognitive Disorders Program at Hoag's Pickup Family Neurosciences Institute. And he also completed a residency in psychiatry and a two-year clinical research fellowship in behavioral neurology. Help me to welcome him. Hi. Hello, everybody. We made it. Second, I think, second to last lecture of the day. You know, anybody watches HBO shows, we always know the most exciting thing happens in the second to last <laughs> lecture. Hopefully, it's not the death of the main character. Uh, <laughs> never know. So, um, my name is Aaron Ritter. I'm, I'm, I'm from Las Vegas, so it's great to be back. If people do live in Las Vegas, we don't have uh, slot machines in our house because they put slot machines everywhere else, so as we've seen. So it's nice to be back. Thank you to the NAF for inviting me uh, to this conference. I've learned so much. Um, it's been a great experience. I'm mostly, the patients I'm working with um, have historically been with Alzheimer's and dementia, um, but I've worked with a number of, of patients with ataxia, so I um, hope to share some of my experiences today with you. Um, this is a disclaimer we've seen from a lot of different lectures, but I, you know, I want to add a point to this. If you have a doctor that says, we don't know enough about ataxia, or I don't know anything about ataxia, don't accept that answer. Give them some homework. They can learn. Doctors get lazy after they go through residency. They can learn. Tell them to learn. Bring them stuff to learn. If you have a doctor, a primary care doctor, or a neurologist that hasn't seen uh, enough ataxia. Don't give them the easy way out, and if they say they, they don't know enough, then, then think about finding somebody new. But really, this is important, because a doc your doctor should know you, but they also should know something about the disease, too. So give them homework. Um, and so, but in, in regards to this lecture, it's important to talk with your, your, your regular doctor about anything we talk about today. Um, I have some disclosures. I know we, we usually go through this pretty quickly. Uh, a couple of fat cats in my life. This is from, you know, I, I, I was going for my very first performance review with my boss, and I was so nervous, and I'm running out of the house, and I think I left the door open to the garage. And this was a reminder that the real boss lives at home. So these are, these are, these are my bosses, these are my fat cats. I, I have no other disclosures, but um, I'm a cat person, so if I see anybody heading for the doors, you've identified yourselves as, as dog people, uh, but that's, this is me, so maybe I'm disclosing a little bit too much about myself. But these are my, these are my bosses. So we're going to talk about the neuropsychology uh, of ataxia. And, and the neuropsychology is really the relationship between brain structure and function. So that's, that's the way I understand neuropsychology. I'm not a neuropsychologist. I'm a neuropsychiatrist, slightly different. Um, but neuropsychology is a really important branch of study and if you have an opportunity to have a neuropsychological assessment, it's very, I think it's very helpful because, because a neuropsychologist will really kind of analyze how your cognition is working. And we can use that as a baseline uh, to tell us what we're good at and what we're bad at. Some, oftentimes, the worst voice in our own brain is telling us we're not very good, and, and we actually the numbers will tell us that we're a little bit better than we think. So, but the neuropsychologist based their practice on the idea that the structure of the brain is related to its function. So in order to kind of talk about that from an ataxia perspective, we're going to talk a lot about the, the anatomy and the function of the cerebellum. It's a really interesting organ and something we'll spend a lot of time talking about today. I know Dr. Hilger did a great talk about anatomy, and I, hope, I think mine will build a little bit on that. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about how the anatomy of the cerebellum affects behavior and cognition. This is kind of a new concept. It's for a long time, we used to think about the cerebellum primarily from a motor perspective. But as, as we'll see, the cerebellum does a lot more than just motor activity. And then I, at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about some of the non-motor symptoms in ataxia, which, which we see. And, and that part um, is a little bit shorter because you know, that part is still under discovery. We haven't done a whole lot of research studies um, that really help us define these things. So, so we'll kind of go through that a little bit quicker, and then hopefully we'll have some questions at the end. Um, 
I'm old enough to know about uh, David Letterman, and he used to do his top 10. And I always find this is to be a helpful way to kind of organize a lecture. One, because um, we kind of know how close we are to the end. Um, and two, because research shows us that you know, from a talk, you probably get one or two things. So we can, we can pick your, your, your ten, one of your 10 things to know from this talk. So we'll start with the easiest one. I think this is uh, the one that I, uh, if, you're, if you're just for number one, uh, you, you'll learn something, that the cerebellum is Latin for little brain. And so this goes back to some of the old anatomists, Aristotle and Galen. Uh, they identified the cerebellum. And we could see it very much on an on a anatomical uh, structure. We could see this structure. But it looks very different than the rest of the brain. You can see it in the, in the picture there that, that, the, that the cerebellum looks a lot different than the rest of the brain. And this fascinated anatomists for a long time. There were a lot kind of theories about what does the cerebellum do? And so you, you can go back and look at some of the Greek literature, uh, some theories about that's, that's the center of the heart. Um, that's where bravery comes from. That's where love comes from. So there's a lot of thoughts about what the structure of the brain does. So we go back. We can see it very, very clearly on a gross uh, picture that the cerebellum is completely different than the rest of the brain. And so number two, I think the cerebellum has a unique structure. And I think that's really important to understand its function. If we kind of can walk through uh, how the cerebellum is different than the cerebrum. Cerebrum is the area above uh, the cerebellum. And it has folds in it. But we can see the cerebellum has got all these folds. Look at, look at all the number of folds. That's because we think about 80% of the neurons in the brain are in the cerebellum. So the cerebellum actually has the most cells in the brain. And it's folded over uh, to increase the surface area. So the cerebellum has a very unique structure and function that makes it slightly different than the, the, the rest of the brain. And so it's a kind of interesting to see that. Um, as you get closer, you can see this folded over structure. And that's primarily so we get a lot of surface area. We get a lot of gray matter. The cerebellum has a lot of activity. And uh, I know this is, this is kind of a, a slide that really uh, crystallized when I was listening um, to some of the lectures earlier about some of these new medications that are coming out. Um, and, and they're working on specific cell layers. And so Dr. Perlman talked a lot about some of these new medicines. And, and we can kind of see that they work on specific cell layers themselves. So this is becoming increasingly important. But the cerebellum is very uh, regimented. It, it, it doesn't change very much. It's got these three cell layers. We've got a molecular layer. And then we've got this very, very thin layer of Purkinje cells. And a lot of our new medicines are going to be working and, and activating these Purkinje cells. And then we have this granular layer that's got a ton of cells. That's where the cerebellum, the primary amount of the cerebellum cells are. And that's why we think when a person has a stroke in the cerebellum, they have so many cells that can, can, can repair. And so often the prognosis for a cere cerebellar stroke uh, may be a little bit better than for a stroke in the cerebrum, because we have all these cells. So, so it's increasingly important to kind of see the cellular organization of the cerebellum and the fact that it's very, very regimented. Um, and then one of the unique features about the cerebellum is it has these, these areas, these, these folded over areas of gray matter called the folia. And we, when we kind of describe that as an arborization, so we can see the cells themselves are kind of organized like a tree. And so that increases the surface layer. So the cerebellum has a a lot of gray matter. It's all folded over. And so it increases the surface area. And those are called the folia. And we don't have folia in the cerebrum. We have uh, gyrus. So the gyrus in the, in the, in the, in the uh, cerebrum is, is very um, uh, spaced out. But in the, in the cere uh, cerebellum, it's very tightly packed. And that's because we think the cerebellum is doing a whole lot of stuff. And then within the, within the white matter of the cerebellum, we have these nucleus, and these nucleus uh, help the cerebellum with its function. And, and one of the most important one is the dentate uh, nucleus, and that's buried deep within the cerebellum. So it's a very complicated uh, structure of the brain. But I don't think a lot of people uh, really have, have studied it very much. And, and, and it's only recently when we've been able to figure out what the heck this thing does. And so 
the cerebellum has a lot of connections within the brain, and so it does a lot of things. And we'll talk about what the primary role of the cerebellum is. But it's got these connections within the brain. And, and a, like I said, a lot of the new medications uh, that were in clinical trials that we're working on modify uh, the ability of these cells to work as well as they used to. So the cerebellum has a lot of connections. And so and overall, this is just kind of a, a description of what the cerebellum is and, and what its functions of it. A lot of connections, a lot of gray matter. And then I think uh, this was underscored in the previous lecture. The cerebellum has a lot of areas that it touches. So it, it connects primarily to the thalamus. The thalamus is kind of like the operator of the brain. And I remember you know, the classic I Love Lucy, where she's trying to connect all the different parts of the brain. That's what the thalamus does in the brain. And the cerebellum works with the thalamus to connect to different parts of the brain. And that's why when we, when we talk about a lot of the ataxias, we can get a wide variety of different symptoms and syndromes that are associated with ataxia. So the cerebellum touches a lot of different parts of the brain. Now, we talked earlier about the difference between dementia and ataxia. And in, in dementia, we see the, the loss of the cerebrum. So the cells themselves are dying above the, the cerebellum. And that's why the symptoms of, of dementia, we're actually losing the cells that are holding memory. And we're losing the, the cells that are holding language. And we're losing the cells that are, that are, that are holding those motor programs for what to do. That's not what's happening uh, in the ataxia. The ataxia is modifying those. So the, the symptoms of dementia are, are vastly different uh, than the, the symptoms we see primarily in, in the neuropsychology of ataxia. So the symptoms are, are, can be very much different. And so uh, we need different therapies and different approaches uh, to, to those different diseases. Uh, just like this, uh, the cerebrum, so just like the rest of the brain, we have, we have four lobes of the brain. We have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And each of those lobes does something different each of the lobes of the cerebellum does something different. And the cerebellum has kind of a unique structure, so it, so it can be broken down into kind of two-dimensional and three-dimensional planes. But in general, I think, I think the way we kind of think about the cerebellum is it has three lobes. So the oldest is the flocular nodular lobe. That's that little guy that's sitting underneath here. That's the oldest lobe. I was told I have to do both both uh, screens here. So, so that's the flocular nodular lobe, and that's primarily involved in eye movement. And then a sort of a, a newer evolutionary lobe, which is the anterior lobe, and that's involved in posture. And then we have the posterior lobe, which is involved in fine motor movement. And so each of these lobes kind of, they have overlap, certainly, but they have a primary role. And then we have this thing called the vermis, which is on the midline. And that becomes increasingly important as we talk about some of the more recent developments in the literature. So if we take a kind of a section where we're cutting the cerebellum in half, we have this picture called the sagittal. So that's the brain stem. So we're looking back at the cerebellum. And this is if we look down at the top. So this is the side, and this is the top. And so the anatomy of the cerebellum becomes really important when we talk about the, the neuropsychology. So this is a, a side view again. And so we can see that each of these different lobes does something different. And that's, that's recapitulated in the rest of the brain. So we talk about a, a, some of the dementias that I see, like frontotemporal dementia. We see people, if their frontal lobe is the, the part of the lobe that's been affected, they may have changes in their behavior, whereas Alzheimer's is a, is a memory center disease. So the brain kind of does that throughout. It has this organization. Uh, within it. So knowing a little bit about the different in, lobes of the, of, the, of the cerebellum is important as we talk about the neuropsychology. OK. So for a long time, we had these crazy theories about what the cerebellum did. We talked about that Latin for little brain. But then the 1800s came, and luckily there was a bunch of, of uh, neurologists, and, and, and later in the, in the early 1900s, some psychiatrists that were really, in, really interested in brain function. Um, and one of these uh, French uh, neurologists was very interested in the cerebellum. And he was a very delicate uh, surgeon. And he did uh, some surgeries where he lesioned the connection uh, 
between the cerebellum and the rest of the brain. Ooh. So we're talking about he lesion this connection. Look at how fine of a surgery he must have had to be able to do to kind of lesion that section. And then he saw what happened with, these, with the pigeons and what they could do. And what we found was that there was no loss of ability to flap their wings, but they couldn't do it in a coordinated manner. So it became very clear that the cerebellum is a very important uh, area of the brain to help coordinate movement. So we, we have a lot to, to, to thank for, for, for this uh, neurologist, Florence, for his ability to kind of help understand the role of the cerebellum. And so for a long time, almost, almost 150 years, 200 years, we thought primarily of the cerebellum as a motor coordinating unit. So it helped coordinate our, our movements. But then uh, what became very clear to a lot of neurologists uh, and as well as surgeons is that the cerebellum seemed to do a little bit more than just movement. And so um, actually I started in pediatrics and we, we would see a lot of, a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, tumors that can affect this, the cerebellum in, in, in children. And what was happening after they had the lesion of the, of, the, of the tumor, primary tumor, what we saw was changes in, in both behavior, in, but primarily in language. And so these, these kids that were getting uh, sur surgeries for their, for their tumors were losing the ability uh, to speak. And so it became a, a, a syndrome called the cerebellar mutism. Uh, syndrome, but as we looked at that cell, those cells before those cell layers and the in the granular layer of the cells, in general, a lot of these kids really relearn their ability to speak. But it was about three or four months that they kind of became uh, mute. So it became very clear uh, that the cerebellum wasn't just around co coordination; it was also behavior because these these children also had some changes uh, in their uh, some of the sort of their their cognitive abilities as well. And so this is uh, kind of some of these surgeries that resulted in cerebellar mutism uh, syndrome. So, so it became very clear learning from these lesional studies. So when, when the brain has been changed by either a stroke or by, by surgery, uh, that there were changes uh, as well in the cerebellum. So the cerebellum had not just a role in, in movement, but also had a role in speech production and in behavior. And so... Uh, the 1990s came, and Dr. Schwaman uh, published a case series of, of 20 different uh, patients that he saw in his lab at Harvard. And he was noticing that in addition to some, some behavioral, I mean, sorry, in movement changes, there was also some behavioral changes or some cognitive changes that, that came along uh, with uh, those patients who primarily had either uh, strokes or, uh, or damage uh, to the cerebellum um, that, were, that were sort of related to the, the blood vessels. Um, but we started to see that damage to the cerebellum could also cause changes in, in thinking and, and behavior. And so now we have this uh, uh, entity known as the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. And, and I think in 2016, we started calling it Schwammann's syndrome um, because we wanted us to misspell, <laughs> uh, <laughs> primarily, but uh, no, but to give credit to one of the great, uh, one of the great thinkers of, of the last 30 years, especially when it comes to cerebellar function. So we give, give credit to a, a great neurologist. Um, but his findings kind of have helped us understand what exactly is the relationship between changes in the cerebellum and changes in, in brain function. And so now we add on, so we, we talked about before, the three lobes of the brain. So we have this flocular, not nodular lobe. We have the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. But then we sort of see that behavior kind of crosses and cognition kind of crosses through those different lobes. Um, and so we see that within this sort of along the vermis and then out laterally that we see areas that the cerebellar uh, functions in, in helping uh, can modulate behavior and cognition. And again, this is, this is primarily from people that have had strokes that we learned this. So what were the, the components of the, of the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome? Uh, patients may, may experience some changes in, in their ability to plan or to reason like at multiple steps, so, so multiple level 
uh, reasoning. So we call this executive function. So this is kind of higher level, really complicated thinking. We see, we see small errors in executive functioning. Spatial cognition, seeing things in space. So, so visual spatial organization uh, and visual spatial memory. And so where this comes up in, in, in a disease like Alzheimer's disease is one of the first symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is folks uh, learn, uh, have difficulty remembering the map of where they live or how to get around. So in, in familiar places, they may, they may get lost. We see a little bit of that uh, as part of the cerebellar uh, cognitive affective syndrome. So seeing, remembering where things are in space. The third was language. Uh, we talked, we had a great lecture uh, from Dr. Hilger about language and, and speech. And we see that in this, in this syndrome, we can see changes in, in, in language abilities, and, and particularly the ability of, of that prosody, of having that mulatoous tone to our speech, um, and then some errors in grammar, and then difficulty naming things. So we see this as part of what the cere cerebellum does. And then finally, when it comes to our emotional state. So, so what we saw with some of those patients uh, with this syndrome is that they may, may not show the same emotions um, uh, present on their face that, that sort of normally would be there. So we see kind of this blunting of affect, which is loss of sort of a, this emotional sort of smile that comes along. Uh, some of the patients uh, may be a little bit disinhibited, having uh, not as much patience. And then in some, in some folks, uh, we see some uh, inappropriate behavior. So this is part of the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. And so based on these stroke studies that, we, that have been done, we started to think about um, what the cerebellum does and how it functions with the cerebrum. So how does it interact? So we clearly know it helps uh, with with motor movements, and, and, and one of the most common neurologic tests for motor movements is this test of dysmetria, where you have the, where you're trying to, to follow the, the hand movements, uh, and the cerebellum really helps coordinate that movement, so it's a precise movement. Um, and so we see that very clearly affected. That's a, one of the primary roles of the cerebellum, is to judge a distance and to help modify that motor output. We have all those cells in the cerebellum, and they work together with the thalamus to be able to quickly modulate our motor movements so that they're more precise. And so we often test for dysmetria in the clinic when we're thinking of, of changes in the cerebellum. So that's what the, the, the purpose of, of the cerebellum is. So we, that was very clear from from studies that go back 200 years. And we're starting to see this in some of these stroke studies. And so out of these kind of, kind of these, this, these stroke studies was the idea of this dysmetria of thought. If we can have a, a little bit of loss of that fine motor movement um, as part of a cere cerebellar disease, we might also see that in our cognition. So the cerebellum, uh, it's become increasingly clear that the cerebellum helps modulate and, and precision with our thinking as well. So, off the, so we've come up with this, this term called dysmetria of thought, which is the mismatch uh, between sort of the actual test and our ability to kind of be very precise with our thinking. So, so we think that the cerebellum now is also involved in the precision of our thinking as well. So that there's, a, there's a concept that the cerebellum helps modulate um, some of the ways that we, we think about uh, our thoughts. And so now, I think it's well accepted now that there's, a, there's certainly motor dysmetria, and then there's cognitive dysmetria. So the cerebellum itself helps us modulate and be precise with our, with our thinking and our memory and coming up with words. And so I know it's, it's very common in some of the patients that I've worked with to kind of miss some of the words barely or miss an end to a, a, a sort of a modifier to a, to an, um, a, a verb. We don't quite use all of the words in the right way that we would like to do at all times. So now we have this concept of cognitive dysmetria that goes with motor dysmetria. And so um, what, what the literature has showed is as we've tested out theories about dysmetria of thought, that, that it turns out that, that some patients, not all, uh, may have some dysmetria of thought that's associated with some of the ataxias. Unfortunately, um, as I think has been a common theme throughout the, the lectures, is we just don't know enough because we haven't had enough time and enough participants in studies to really make definitive 
uh, conclusions about what the effect of the ataxias are on cognition. But we have this general sense that the cognitive dysmetria is present, and we've seen it in, in, many, of, and in many of the uh, um, uh, SCAs. We've also seen some association between dementia and some of the SCAs, but again, these are hard to really make sense of because you know, it can have multiple diseases, and we don't really know um, exactly the so sort of associations between dementia and SCAs. And, and certainly in, in my clinical experience, um, the symptoms between uh, conditions like Alzheimer's are completely different um, than, they, than they are uh, with the uh, ataxias. And that's primarily because of the difference of what the cerebellum does versus what the cerebrum does. Again, the cerebellum is a coordinating activity. So we, it's working on coordinating our thoughts and our thinking. So I think it would be unlikely that we would see the same kind of uh, dementia symptoms that we get in other diseases like Alzheimer's disease. OK. So neuropsychiatric symptoms are sort of the uh, sort of psychiatric manifestations of neurologic diseases. And that's primarily uh, my practice. And, and we see, um, as, a, as a consequence, both directly as the pathology of the disease and all the other things that come with having a chronic neurologic disease, that we see psychiatric symptoms emerge. And by far, the most common uh, psychiatric symptom um, in the ataxia is, uh, is depression. So we've seen high levels of higher levels than um, general populations in um, the most common ataxias. Um, and so depression is a, is a it's common in the general population, but it's also very common in, in some of, the, of our ataxias. But these are the ones that have been studied the best. So I think we're going to see that depression is also common in, in other uh, ataxias. Um, I think I'll kind of throw this out to the audience. Um, you know, I think what is, the best, what is the best treatment for depression? I'm not talking about a major depressive disorder, or sort of an episode of depression, but depression. Does, just have somebody yell it out. What is the best treatment? For, what have we seen the best? Laughter. Nature. I'm, exercise. I'm so glad we didn't hear pills, medications. So, so, so this is important. I think, I think we think about major depressive disorder. So our medication, so the serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Zoloft and Prozac, those have a place, particularly in episodes of severe depression. So when we have people that have depressive symptoms that come on, we have m multiple symptoms like loss of energy, loss of interest, suicidal thoughts, inability to focus, poor sleep. Clearly, there's a role for, for antidepressants in major depressive episodes. But across the literature, when it comes to neurologic disease and it comes in, in diseases that, that where there's no neurologic uh, disease, exercise, being part of a community, nature, all these lifestyle factors are just as effective. And I think the best studied one is exercise. So I think the, the correct answer to the question is exercise is by far the best treatment for depression. So if, you see, if we see patients in our clinic and there's a depression, which is just kind of feeling down, often chronic, we want to get people to exercise movement. So we talked about the brain. We, we release a number of endorphins from the brain stem when we exercise. So it doesn't, there's not a goal of how much exercise is getting, getting any form of exercise. That's the best treatment for depression. So anxiety. So anxiety is the second most common uh, symptom uh, that we see in the ataxias. What's the best treatment for anxiety across diseases? Could you just yell it out again? What's the best? Exercise. Exercise. Again, exercise is the answer. The second, best, the second best one for anxiety is actually exposure therapy. So exposing yourself to the anxiety. So th that is often best done in talk therapy. And I talk about sometimes the worst, uh, the worst voice is the voice that we hear inside of our brain. And it rattles around, and it, we have all these thoughts in the middle of the night, or um, that are not well formed. So if anybody has anxiety, it's important to find somebody you can talk to, whether that's a, it's a therapist, or whether that's a family member, or that's a community. Get those thoughts out. Get those anxious thoughts out. Expose yourself uh, 
to some of those anxious thoughts. And if it's a specific thing like, like uh, speaking in front of a large group, then, then expose yourself to, to being in front of a group and talking. So the more we expose ourselves to the things we worry about, the things we, we, we fear, the better we are off we are. So the best treatments for the number one and number two common neuropsychiatric symptoms are not pills. Um, they are lifestyle modifications. So those are the most important things to I think, think about when we're thinking about depression and anxiety. Exercise, exposure, uh, talking to other people, uh, get, becoming part of a community I think is, is so important. And we, 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 we don't have medicines that increase endorphins. Um, so it's so important to think about other ways than just medications to help these symptoms. Um, so studies have also showed that fatigue is a very common symptom in the ataxia. So this is a tough one. And so the best treatment for treating fatigue is fixing your sleep. So I know sleep is, is really hard and it's really uh, challenging um, to get under control when it's not going well, but we want to make sure that, that our sleep is good. That's the number one treatment for fatigue is, is fixing our sleep. So what does that mean? So have a, a pretty set schedule for sleep, and we want to make sure we're going to bed at the same time pretty much every night and getting up at the same time um, in the morning. We want to get some sunlight exposure in the afternoon. So afternoon sunlight exposure is really, really important if we're having uh, poor sleep um, and we want to get our sleep under control. The second best treatment for fatigue is exercise. So we want to make sure we're getting, so it seems paradoxical. Our body is telling us when we're tired, the last thing we want to do is exercise but it's by far the best thing to do for fatigue. So if we have fatigue, we want to talk about uh, fixing our sleep and exercising. There are medications that can be used off-label for fatigue. All medications for fatigue have side effects, so there's always a trade-off for, for medications uh, for fatigue. Uh, we often use uh, medications for fatigue in, in conditions like MS and Parkinson's disease. Um, and oftentimes we, we run into a lot of side effects. So these are the, I think the best things to start with are uh, uh, sleep and exercise. But again, medications can be, can be helpful. Apathy. So I think this is the number one uh, neuropsychiatric symptom that I see in our clinic. This is the most common symptom uh, that's associated with dementia is apathy. And apathy isn't quite depression. It's really kind of a lack of interest, motivation, or concern. It's like living, but, but no, no real motivation, no zest to kind of participate in everyday life. And apathy and it drives family members crazy uh, because we want to spend time with our family members. We want to get them out and doing things. So apathy is really, really difficult to, to treat. So for fatigue, where we do have some medications, there are no medications that have ever been shown to help with apathy. The only thing that's ever been able to help with apathy in clinical trials is the schedule. So fixing a schedule, getting things uh, in a normal routine. So we know it's super important when somebody is in an apathetic state that they have some regular routine, whether that's one activity a day, whether that's five activities a day, you schedule it, you put it on the calendar, and then you just do it. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, because a person with apathy will say no all day long until they're blue in the face, until they're actually out. And then, they, then that helps. And if a person has apathy and is still you know, kind of not enjoying activities, not enjoying the dinner out with fa family or friends, then we might want to rethink the diagnosis of apathy, because usually people with apathy actually kind of like being out. They kind of like going on uh, an activity, and you have such a great time, and then you go back to the pa back to your per the person with apathy and say, "Do you want to do that again?" They said, "No." You know. So the biggest thing is you just got to do it and and take no for an you can't take no for an answer. Um, there's been a couple studies that have seen that apathy is particularly common in SCA one and two, but again, these are really small studies. So I think. I think we're going to see that, that apathy is just cuts across all neurologic diseases. We want to motivate people to do things and be as active as possible. All right, so this is kind of the disappointing slide of, of, the, whole, of the whole talk, and that's about the, the treatments. And so 
unfortunately, there hasn't been a whole lot of treatments, and there's been pretty much no studies that have looked specifically at how we treat these neuropsychiatric or neuropsychological symptoms of ataxia. There, you know, there's a lot of medicines that have, are used for cognition and dementia. We, we don't really know uh, how much they work in other conditions, and particularly ataxia. Um, we don't really know uh, from clinical trials how the SSRIs and the SNRIs and the other medications uh, work for, for a lot of the ataxias just because the, the research hasn't been done, and that's a, that's a big disappointment. But what we can do is we can borrow uh, our knowledge from other uh, psychiatric and neurologic conditions and try and, and borrow things, but there's always a risk uh, to that with medications, so I want to stress the importance of lifestyle modifications. It's super important to think about ways to increase our exercise, ways to increase our cognitive engagement, ways to fix our sleep, uh, and start there first. But if those don't work, certainly we borrow uh, medications from, from uh, other uh, conditions where we know a little bit more. Um, and that's what we do in our clinic, and, and oftentimes if we've, we've, we've found that therapy isn't working for depression, exercise isn't working, we're still certainly depressed, uh, there are different options. Uh, oftentimes uh, we start with uh, some supplements and, and improving and optimizing uh, medical functioning, and then we may uh, borrow from uh, our psychiatric medications. So, uh, one of the last things that we, we talk about is that there is some evidence and there's emerging number of studies that have looked at uh, electrical stimulation. So our brain is basically a big circuit that runs off electricity um, using ions, neurotransmitters, and we're finding that increasingly we can use things like direct stimulation using magnets and currents to manipulate that uh, flow of electricity. And so there's, there's uh, something known as transmagnetic stimulation that's been shown to be helpful in certain forms of depression. This is an example of what transmagnetic stimulation uh, can do. Uh, and um, we're hoping that uh, as our knowledge, as, as our ability to, to learn about these new technologies and how they can, uh, we can directly manipulate the electricity in the brain, maybe we'll be able to do uh, electrical stimulation of the cerebellum. There's been a couple studies that have looked at that specifically, I think primarily in, in the context of stroke. Uh, so the future is likely to, to come with modalities that are a little bit less medically uh, defined and more specifically uh, electrically defined and uh, specific to some of the, our, the pathology that's going on in the diseases. Okay. So number 11, so we're at, the, we're at the end here. So I think my summary today is that I think we've, we've learned and I hope I've demonstrated that the cerebellum is more than just a motor organ. It, it does more than just coordinate movement. Uh, I think a following up point is that there's a unique organization to the cerebellum that makes it very different than the cerebrum. So it's a se separate organ and the symptoms that come with with changes to the, to the cerebellum are different than the changes that come to the cerebrum. One of the most uh, important uh, discoveries over the last uh, 40 years in the field of neuropsychiatry is that there is a syndrome that occurs when, the, when there's damage to the cere uh, cerebellum from strokes. And we see changes in executive function, spatial memory, language, and affect and emotional states. And we're starting to see this, this concept of dysmetria of thought is when the brain has a hard time modulating the precision of cognition. And so that's what we learned uh, primarily about the neuropsychology of the cerebellum more recently. And then cognitive changes may occur in, in some of the ataxias, and not all patients certainly experience cognitive changes, and this is certainly an understudied area. But I think what we're gonna see as we, as we get more studies around what the sort of uh, impact of, of the ataxias on, on cognition is we're going to see that it's going to be, it's going to overlap a lot with the, the co uh, cere cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. I think we're going to see primarily precision of executive thinking, uh, language, and then modulation of our emotional states. So I think, I think that, that we're going to really start to see this concept of dysmetry of thought really be studied. Um, and then finally, the neuropsychiatric manifestations of, of the ataxias are, are 
overlap heavily with a lot of the other neurologic diseases, overlap heavily with what we see in folks without neurologic uh, diseases, such as depression, anxiety, and apathy, and fatigue. And so we want to be really uh, aggressive in, in treating these uh, syndromes and symptoms. And I, and I think the best way right now, the best evidence is behind um, uh, lifestyle approaches as the, as the first step and then borrowing from our uh, psychiatric uh, conditions uh, in medications using the smallest doses um, uh, to avoid side effects. And so with that, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Okay, and I think there's a couple in the crowd. Came in was about, um, do you think that the cerebellum can grow, regenerate itself? Can the, so the question was about can the cerebellum regenerate itself? Um, that's, a hard, that's a hard one to answer. I think the, the capacity is potentially there because we looked at those cellular levels Certainly in the granular uh, le level, there's a lot of cells there. We don't have the ability to regrow cells at this time. It's hard to deliver cells into certain areas. Um, I know we do a lot of, there's a lot of talk about stem cells, and hopefully the, the future in, in the, sort of the future of, of, of treatments are to regrow cells. We don't have that ability. I'm hopeful, but I think the answer to that question is eventually yes. We just don't know when. Okay. We have a question out here, uh, Dana. And Hello, so I have a question about the cerebellum in general, but also because I have ataxia, I think a lot of ataxians have the issue of overthinking, worrying about what others think of you with ataxia. What is a way to somewhat control your thinking so you don't have to worry about what others think? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the question speaks to what do we do with that maybe anxiety or those thoughts, those excessive thoughts about how we're being perceived by, by other people? I, I think the best uh, literature evidence about that is to find somebody to talk to that about, right? So we've got to get these thoughts that are bouncing around in our head. I think about the, the game Pong. That's a lot of our thoughts are just bouncing around in our head. The first step is to really get those thoughts out, form them out. We talked about uh, some of the folks this, this earlier today were talking about journaling, writing these things out, getting them out of the head so they're not just bouncing around as these unformed thoughts and get them out. Um, I think that's the first step. I, you know, I, I think anxiety is a, is a, is a com it's a sort of adaptive process. It helps us uh, in some ways, but it can get really out of, out of control. But I think the first step is to really, to really know that that's, that's not that uncommon. That is a common thing we see in a lot of other folks. And the best, I think, first step is to really have somebody to be able to talk with that, get those thoughts out of the head, onto paper, or out into the verbal ether. And then sometimes those thoughts will, will kind of go down. I think that's the first step, is really to talk about it. Get those out of, the, out of your head and get them written down or talk, talk with somebody about them. Great. We're going to take two more questions. One question is um, about sleep disturbances that are present in a taxi or in, if you have any strategies for those. Yeah, um, that's a great question, and I, I, I think um, what is what can be really helpful is to do a sleep a sleep study because a lot of times our perception of how we sleep uh, may not line up with what the actual reality is. Um, a first step with that is to to monitor our sleep. So there's a bunch of apps and a bunch of things that we can do to monitor our sleep. So get some data regarding sleep. I think is a first step. And I think the, the very most important step that I think some, some people, um, we, we hit a lot, but we don't always follow through with is sleep hygiene. We want to be going to bed around the same time every night. We want to get up around the same time every night. Um, we want to sort of wind down in the evening. There's a lot of, recent, a lot of, a lot of guidance around sleep hygiene. Um, but I would recommend a, a, a sleep study for f if we're thinking that there's a lot of challenges around sleep. Great advice. And we have one last question. Right back here. There you go. So you mentioned these cognitive changes occurring in some ataxias, but not all, and how this is an understudied area. To fill the gap in the literature, um, where, where would you start? 
if you were designing, you know, a research study, what, you know, what would you do? <laughs> well, so I, th I think the, the best way to start is with natural history studies that also not only just take into consideration the motor symptoms. I, I, I know that the history is we focus so much on the motor symptoms, but also to, to include uh, neuropsychological val uh, sort of uh, metrics as well. And historically, that wasn't done to the, to the level that I think it, it's going to be done going forward. So natural history studies are where we follow people over time and, and we get this rich uh, re repository of data. A good question. Great. Thank you so much. It was very interesting.